DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Father Augustine Weta, who is a monk of St. Louis Abbey. He serves as the Director of Chaplaincy at the St. Louis Priory School, where he teaches and coaches rugby. During his spare time, Father Augustine supervises the juggling team, cultivates carnivorous plants, and raises carpenter ants and serves. With Father Augustine Weta, we go inside the pages of Humility Rules, St. Benedict's 12-step guide to genuine self-esteem, published by Ignatius Press. Father Weta, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. What an honor. I love Humility Rules, St. Benedict's 12-step guide to genuine self-esteem. Ah, the, the key word there is genuine, isn't it? Yeah. In fact, I, full disclosure here, I, I don't really believe in self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> the, the title is misleading. I, mm-hmm. I just, I, in fact, I got tired of hearing about self-esteem and I work with teenagers and people are always filling their heads with these empty cliches. And in fact, the story behind it is that we had this wonderful shrink, sorry, uh, therapist in mm. the school and named of all things, Dr. Fury. And mm. he and I would go back and forth every morning. We would have these swap cliches, like you're perfect just the way you are and follow your dreams and think, think outside the box, you know, these sort of empty, this empty nonsense that, that I think is likely to turn our teenagers into sort of empty-headed narcissists rather than mm-hmm. <laughs> self-confident achievers. And and then the, to put the icing on the cake, I was at the pharmacist picking up some medicine for one of the old guys, and uh, there was a book on the shelf, and I had been thinking about all this stuff, and it was, and I hope I get the title wrong so I don't get sued or something, but mm-hmm. it was called, uh, I think, The the teen's guide to self-esteem and the subtitle was learning to love the most important person in the world. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. I looked at the pharmacist. And I said, this is the worst advice you could ever give a kid. Like as if like, on the one hand, they already think they're the center of the world. And then imagine the pressure that a kid is going to feel if he thinks he's the center of the world. And they they gave me the book <laughs> and mm. I took it home and I thought, you know, I'm, there's got to be a, countermeasure or a, an antidote out there somewhere. And sure enough, it was right under my nose in the rule of St. Benedict. If we're going to do full disclosure, I need to let everybody know that <laughs> I'm an oblate of St. Benedict and I love the holy rule. And what I love what you did with this book is you made it so accessible. I cannot help but think St. Benedict would have... A, I you know to follow the just the the joy of the book I can't I cannot think that he would not have a big smile on his face on this one uh, he would say <laughs> well done because I it, hope so because it, it it does break it open and, and I at first I have to say th- that Ignatius Press has done a beautiful job in bringing this book forward because it ah. truly bears the weight of the mystery contained in it. It is. It's the, the material is beautiful. The book is just sort of heavy in the hand. Uh, yeah, you're right. They, I owe them so much. And then the images. Okay, this it wouldn't be Benedictine if we didn't have a ma- illuminated manuscript, but yet it has a particular spin to it with each particular picture, doesn't it? <laughs> well, my mother is a kind of a famous artist, and so if there was bad art in the book, I was never going to live it down. And uh, so, yeah, I, one of the kids in the school taught me how to use Photoshop. And so I went through old manuscripts, illustrations of monks and one sort or another and Photoshopped little skateboards and uh, iPods and things into the pictures so that, I don't know, maybe it was a little more uh, accessible. I hadn't realized that you were the one that did this to the images. Well, thanks. The, the cover, actually, I the, the copyright issues were just beyond me. And fi- and the cover illustration we thought was the nicest, but I couldn't get the copyright to it. So that one is actually painted by my mother. <laughs> oh, wonderful. But the rest of it is, yeah, old manuscripts, thanks to all the museums that let me use their images. Right in the very beginning of the role, just for everybody who, if you're not familiar with the Holy Rule of St. Benedict, it, we're called to listen with the ear of our heart. And what you've done is you've taken 
particular elements of that very ancient rule that for some, if they just read it dry, it would be very dry. But but what you've done is you've listened with the ear of your heart and you were able to hear it and then bring it out so that contemporary ears could take it in. Yeah. Well, I, I confess that it always surprises me when somebody <laughs> likes the I mean, Oh, come I on. It it's good, it's wonderful, no, Father. Good. I thought it was going to be good, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't have tried to publish it. But at the same time, I, you know, what, well, when the uh, when the abbot decided to make me postulant master, it totally took me by surprise. And I said to him, my knee jerk reaction was to say, "But I'm a terrible monk." <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, you are, but your heart's in the right place." So mm. the the truth is, none of the wisdom is mine. It's it's all it, it, if I I don't know how many times I say. Some old guy in the monastery told me X, you know, so it's it's all stuff that other monks, older monks, wiser monks have told me. So I'm just a conduit. Isn't that one of the aspects of the rule is that you're supposed to listen? You know, the old monk in the, the abbey, when the day comes, you're the old monk in the abbey. People are listening to you. You've clearly, you're clearly, you, you're, you know what you're talking about. Yeah, you're right. It is. What would a monk be if he didn't listen to other people? So I guess may, maybe I'm. Maybe I maybe there is something there. <laughs> it's true. Well, let's answer that question, which is so important and which you brought up in the beginning of our conversation. Why is humility important? Actually, I was talking with uh, one of our alumni, and he just got married. And he married a Hindu woman, a beautiful and pious woman. She ended up converting, but not at the time when they were dating. And he found it really easy to relate to her family because he knew where he stood. And even though their religion was very foreign to him, he knew who he was. He knew how he was saved as it were. And, and what his convictions were. We, we live in such a gosh, tumultuous world. And it seems more and more aggressive and, and outrageous by the day. But if, if you, are grounded, if, if you know who you are, then it's rather easy, I think, to, to encounter that world. I was actually telling my junior ethics class, I teach a class in, of all things, sexual ethics to the juniors in our high school. And on the last day, they asked me why I did it, because it, it is kind of rough sometimes. But I said that, and the image just kind of occurred to me that the church is like this mountain, and the kids are all flying around in this kind of tornado of influences. And I feel sometimes like I've got one hand on the mountain and I'm trying to grab kids and Mm -hmm. pull them in, you know, I guess that's what it's all about is, is finding that rock, the rock. For a Benedictine, we understand that imagery of the ladder that for St. Benedict. And maybe you could explain that to people because what you've done in the book is you've given us the steps up that, that ladder. Yeah, I guess in a way we're all sort of children, St. Benedict talks about his rule as a little rule for beginners. And, um, and yeah, originally the book was written for kids, but it seems to have had even more success with adults. But the ladder itself, St. Benedict says it's the, the, the same ladder that's when they talk about the angels ascending and descending. And he says, say ascending and descending, because uh, the higher you climb on this ladder, the lower you get. And so each each step is a way of littling yourself, mm-hmm. but also getting higher and closer to God. And th- this is why I think sometimes you, you listen to some of the saints, like Teresa of Avila, of all people, you know, talking about how awful they are. And you think, no, you're not. You're a saint. But the closer you get to God, the less holy you feel. So it shouldn't be surprising, I guess, that you feel more sinful the holier you get. I think that's primarily because as we're getting closer to what is good, because the world tells us what's good. The world tells us what we should be. Like you said, like going to the pharmacy and and seeing this book on the bookshelf, according to the world, you're the most important. But as you get closer to heaven and you get closer to what is the ultimate good, you realize you want to be that and you're not there yet. And you want to be that. And isn't that the quest of our hearts, Father? Yeah. 
and and it's not about building yourself up. I mean, the more you do that, I think the less happy you're actually going to be. Janis Joplin said, the the great theologian yeah, said, uh, right. the freedom's <laughs> freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Mm-hmm. That, you know, when you you read like the the Psalms say, "I'm a worm and I'm no man and I'm the laughing stock," and but if that's really the way you think of yourself, then anything you get is a gift. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. There's nowhere to go but up. In fact, I have this. I have an atheist friend who said to me not long ago, "The problem with Catholics is that when they're when they're happy, they're happy, and when they're miserable, then they're really happy." And it, he meant it as a criticism, but in a way, I think that's a great way to live because you, suffering is transformed into joy, and you you just can't lose. One of those rungs. Well, it's the very beginning of the rung that you have in the book. It's to have a fear of God, and. Today, especially, not only for teens, but I think for their parents, and well, quite frankly, everyone in the world, there is a great fear. We, we, we've seen it in our own culture in, in recent times where you can't even go to school now and not be afraid. And so when we hear the term fear of God, we connect it with that kind of fear, don't we? Yeah, in a way, yes. I mean, it's not as though God is out to get us, like he's, you know, sitting up in heaven ready to hit the smite button. But the other thing is, I don't think we're really, uh, and being afraid of God is not the goal or even uh, a, a very high step, but it is a, it is somewhere to start. I, hell is really, I think, what we fear, or God's justice, maybe. I, I guess it was one of the old monks told me, if you don't know where you're going, at least it helps to know where you want to avoid. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so th- that fear of hell or fear of judgment is a good start. The, the goal is a perfect love that drives out fear. But even so, when, when people speak of fear of God, I think it's mainly um, a deep fear of offending him. You know, the way you would you would never want to, to hurt someone that you love. Um, but there is also, I mean, you know, the, the Bible is full of imagery like uh, of the, the great judge of judges, the king of kings, the Jesus coming in on the last day with his name carved into his thigh, you know, to separate the goats and the sheep and the wailing and gnashing. Of we tend to sort of ignore all that kind of stuff. And I think I think that's a that's a, an impoverishment of our faith as well. The fact that we would deny in some ways that element. I mean, again, I go back to what are we afraid of right now? What we fear right now is ultimate evil, because we're experiencing it, we're seeing it. And where do you think evil dwells? Not just in hell, but in the darkness of our own heart, sometimes in the darkness of other people's hearts, and the unwillingness to reach out to help remedy in some cases, don't you think? Yeah. Well, there's a little homework assignment at the end of the chapter on fear of God that you used to spare the life of a bug. And I got that image from one of our young monks who, of all things, he was converted by reading this Puritan sermon. It's kind of a famous sermon called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. It's a beautiful piece of rhetoric and very Puritan. But the images of the fighter hanging over a flame by the narrowest thread. And he said, you know, I hadn't really taken God seriously. And this really made it clear what was on the line. And so, ironically, that that real sort of terror of hell was what woke him up out of his stupor. Um, and he's this particular kid guy is is no idiot. He went to Princeton and he ran a restaurant and he he really he's aware of the world. But it was that wake up call, you know, that that the fear of God can be can kind of jolt you out of your comfortable mediocrity. Mm-hmm. That next rung on the ladder is self-denial. Okay, now that mm. is so countercultural because the goal is to be able to get as much as you want. We love to follow the rules so long as they don't really challenge us. Yeah, but mm-hmm. self-denial is what keeps us grounded. Is what uh, it, well, it's what frees us right from mm-hmm. from being slaves to to our appetites. See, I have a friend who's an artist who had an opportunity to be a really kind of famous artist. She was friends with um, Andy Warhol, and she was part of that scene, and she left it to teach herself how to draw again. And as a result, her, her career kind of tanked for a while, 
But she said, and I've carried this with me all my life, that I would have been a fool to sacrifice joy for the sake of fun. Oh, wow. And yeah, isn't that great? Oh, wow. Uh, when people ask me why I'm not, why I left the beach patrol, uh, you know, being a monk isn't always as fun as being a lifeguard, but in my defense, there's nothing more depressing than a 47-year-old lifeguard. You, you've got to sacrifice something sooner or later, you know, for for joy. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with fun, but when you sacrifice joy for fun, then I think, but well, you just end up empty and alone and lost. It is so compelling what you just said, what you just said, what she did, and what you did when you heard what she said. It's all more confusing. But I mean, that <laughs> now this is really the key to obedience because obedience, by its definition, is deep listening. You're listening yeah. very deeply because there's a wisdom, there's a reason, there's a in you. And you trust that. Yeah. I, there's a story. I, I was sharing this. That the third step is obedience. And I was sharing this with uh, one of the missionaries of charity. And she told me a story about how she used to have to sleep in this cottage in the Amazon, I guess it was, with three other nuns. And one of the nuns would come in every night and close all the windows. And it was sweltering inside this shack. And finally, the uh, and she never said anything because that's the way missionaries of charity are. They don't complain. Mm-hmm. But finally, this other nun went off on a trip or something. And that night, they got to open up all the windows. And she said it was great. But the next morning, they woke all woke up with snakes in their beds. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so obedience, you know, this mutual obedience is about trusting that they're closing the windows for a reason. <laughs> right, right. When I was supposed to give the toast at my sister's wedding, one of the old monks, I went to him to ask her what to say, ask him what to say to her. And he said, you tell her that someday he'll want the window open and she'll want the window closed. Mm. And that was it. Mm. And now I understand what he meant. Right. That's where this understanding comes in. I it And the tradition, the great tradition, legacy of the Benedictines. And the wisdom, it goes all the way back to the Desert Fathers. And in that next rung where it talks about perseverance, it really has, I mean, we've been taught by the Desert Fathers that there's there's something that tempts us, you know, that, that Assidia, that, that noonday devil that comes along and wants to do whatever, anything possible to get you to get off track. Yeah, or just to stay where you are, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, just to kind of, uh, I think I tend to think of that uh, Noonday Devil, which is another great book, by the way, mm-hmm. um, that that it's more for me. It's not so much about running away as just sort of taking a nap <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> instead of doing my work, you know, playing a video game or, you know, just kind of I someone asked me once, why do you have to be a monk? Isn't it enough just to be a good person? And mm-hmm. I think that's what a CDA is, you know. Yeah, it's just it's enough just to just to be a good person. But that's the minimum, right? I mean, mm-hmm. everybody's supposed to be a good person. The alternative is to be a bad person, and no one's called to that. It, it's the try to, overcoming a CDA is about not settling for being a good person, trying to be a saint, you know. Sure. Well, and failing that now that and and then starting again, getting up, starting again. <laughs> We're talking with Father Augustine Weta about his book, Humility Rules, St. Benedict's 12-Step Guide to Genuine Self-Esteem. And it just, as you said, we might as well just keep going up the ladder if you don't mind, Father, because (laughs) step five is the one, well, we don't like this one, repentance. Come on, we hear it, the the prophets call out, but isn't it one thing just to say, I'm sorry, but it's another thing to say, do you forgive me? There's a difference, Ooh. isn't there? Because I'm sorry you can just throw it out there and, okay, then walk away. But with, do you forgive me? You have to wait and listen. Do you forgive me? Or is there something I have to do to uh. fix this? I mean, there, it's different, isn't it? There's a interesting part of the rule that if you're, like, if you show up late to a meeting, that you would have to, you got to bow down. And you gotta you gotta make amends. You gotta say, "I'm so- forgive me," and it's very humbling. We do need that ability to be able to seek that in repentance, don't we? 
At our monastery, if you're late for prayers, you have to stand in the middle of the choir, in the middle of the church, and bow and wait for the abbot to knock. Mm. <laughs> and it's humiliating, and I do it all the time. I'm I'm so often late for stuff that they've begun to refer to me as the late Father Augustine. And oh, dear. It's, it is humiliating. But it's also, you know, when, when you're late for something, it tells people, you know, my time is more important than your time. You mm-hmm. guys can sit around and wait for me. And, yeah, that does demand an apology. But it's hard to do, boy. In all of this, for the, especially for the Benedictine, and this is why this wisdom has been around for centuries. Millennia. I mean, it is so mm-hmm. it's so grounded because if you really enter into the rule, and this is why it's so wonderful how you've broken it open in a new way, in a in a really compelling way, that it can bring about balance, and balance affords us serenity, even when mm. weird things are happening, and serenity is. It's so hard to get today, Father. I mean, heaven help you if you subscribe to somebody's Twitter account and then there's tweets coming up every two seconds with a phone that you never leave, you never put aside. I mean, I hope you don't yeah. have to deal with that that temptation of, of the smartphone. Uh, I wish. I'm, unfortunately, or fortunately, my book sort of went viral and the abbot got me a cell phone. Ah. Uh, but I, I'm I'm proud to say that I still haven't quite figured it out. I made it a rule that I wouldn't look at it unless I was sitting down. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, I suddenly noticed that I was like all these kids at our school. And I was walking around with my head down. And not because I was praying. Uh, the old monk said it looks like they're, they, they said they look like they've all con- converted to Hasidic Judaism. They're all mm-hmm. bent over, bowing, and he said it would be fine if they were bowing over the scriptures, but they're bowing over their cell phones. Well, Father, their parents are doing that, too. I mean, in the yeah. community they're in, everybody's doing that. Yeah, I don't know if it's even—I'm beginning to wonder whether it's even avoidable. I, we had a retreat, and I, I told them all to hand in their cell phones— And I'd say a good third of the kids handed me old, broken cell phones so they could hold on to theirs. We had a good talk uh, later that day, but it's it's become sort of a part of their brain, and and it's there's no no denying it's it's an addiction as well. But it it draws you out of the world and into yourself again, and yeah, it's I know I don't know. I guess someday we'll we'll figure out how to tame this animal, but it at the moment it seems to be, be gaining the upper hand I, to mix a lot of metaphors. Well, you did it very well. You made a very nice smoothie. <laughs> it was very smooth, your mixing of those metaphors. <laughs> but, you know, it, and we talked, the, the next run would be self-abasement, and we kind of touched upon that, about how you, not to take yourself so seriously, to realize yeah. who you are. The eighth step, and I think can be surprising that this would be the one at the top of the, the ladder, that yeah. you would have prudence. And, and in a yeah. real way, that's discernment, too. I mean, prudence is a, a loving discernment. Yeah. And it's and is knowing and backing off. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And I think, I think it was G.K. Chesterton said something like, before you tear down a wall, be sure you know what's on the other side. Mm-hmm. Or it, we have the, especially... And again, it's, well, it used to be just with teenagers, but I, I think we're starting to become perpetual teenagers. So maybe that's why this book has become so popular. Let's break the rules and see what happens. I tell my students, if you want to be really rebellious, if you really want to go against the tide and cause a stir, be obedient. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. do, tell, tell people you're Catholic. Do, you know, do, a, do, do what your religion dictates, you know, because these rules and doctrines and laws and teachings, they didn't just drop out of the air. I mean, they were by trial and error and, and heartbreak and heartache, you know, the, your elders have come up with these rules to save you the, the pain of having to discover it for yourself. It, with that prudence, there is, and this is what's so countercultural right now, too, is silence. Now, yes, mm. the, the, okay, just have your, your basic silence 
where, you know, in your room or I went through this this morning, actually, I was feeling uncomfortable just sitting and praying and I wanted to go put on some, what I thought, beautiful classical music. But then I thought, why am I even doing that? You know, stop. And then we're also encouraged now, speak your mind, say something. So in the social media culture that we have, and some of the things that we're saying if you go back and you even read some of the things that you wrote, the, it lacks virtue, yeah. and all it does is forment pain. It's it, yeah, it is the the uh, increasingly as a priest, I, I find myself giving the penance of deliberately wasting time it is to sit somewhere and not even uh, just waste time with Jesus, not necessarily say any particular prayers, not not try to work on your meditation or you know, get a rosary done just, and definitely not stay, t- wait for the phone to ring or surf the internet, but to just sit there, just waste five minutes with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's a, with, with our cell phones and everything, we can now get things accomplished in the car. We can get things accomplished on the way. We, and it, it doesn't seem to actually be making us much more productive, if you ask me, at least not spiritually. Mm-hmm. If you could, on that step 10, I mean, talk to us about dignity. I, I, you know, I don't even know if that's a word that people can define anymore. Uh, well, it, it, this is all tied up with laughter in St. Benedict's head, which is ironic because uh, I, we, we spend a lot of time laughing in the monastery. In fact, I just just the other day, I saw the novices careening around, across campus in a uh, golf cart that they had filched from the maintenance department, and it was just hilarious to watch them. And but the the kind of laughter that Saint Bet you know Saint Benedict says, "Don't be too quick to laugh," and that were used to worry me. But our Father Timothy, who translated the rule, wrote wrote in fact the going translation. He said. It's more, it's not the kind of laughter that bubbles up. It's the kind of laughter that sounds like, (laughs) 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 that you, you, when you're laughing at someone or Mm -hmm. you're laughing because of something crude, but not the joyful laughter, the life affirming laughter. Mm -hmm. Someone just did a, recently did uh, a sociologist did a study of jokes. And it turns out that Americans prefer jokes that make people look stupid. Isn't that sad? When we think of reverence, we think of bow, I have to be quiet, I have to honor. Mm-hmm. And and that's true in some ways. I, I, I love the Benedictine habit of when you when you encounter another, you bow because you bow to mm. Christ in them, in essence. Yeah. Is that true, Father? I mean, is that is that a, an element of that aspect of reverence? It is. It is seeing Christ in one another. Um, isn't it? Didn't yeah? It was Mother Teresa who said the way to be a saint is to smile at the people you live with. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's it, it's about knowing where you really are. And I was just thinking, like just a second, that in a way, my my thoughts have turned in a kind of negative direction about how awful the world is and all that sort of stuff. But reverence is the solution, is kind of the antidote to that, because the world is beautiful, and people are beautiful. And, you know, even tied up in our cell phones and yelling at each other, there's still, you look around, and, and, and the world is, is charged with the glory of God. And you can even see that glory in your neighbor and in the people you live with. And And the more annoying and frustrating they are, the more... She, uh, again, Mother Teresa said that uh, I see she saw Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor, mm-hmm. it, which means that she felt they were distressing, and and so the more you're distressed by your neighbor, the more sort of excited you can be to see Jesus <laughs> mm-hmm. that he's that you can be assured that he's right there, disguising himself in your presence, and it's it that's really thrilling, I and mean, even even. Uh, you know, lately, with all this stress and tumult, at the same time, it's, it's thrilling to be at the forefront of the battle. You know, to be on on the winning side and and to be part of Christ's army, and even just looking at trees and the faces of a bunch of recalcitrant seventh graders it can be an experience of the glory of God. And 
I think that's I think that's what reverence is all about. Well, Father Wood, I could talk to you all day. I really could. What it is this has just been a joy well, a joyful conversation. And I it and you know, I just have to tell folks that if if you weren't aware of it, the charism for the Benedictines is hospice. It's it, it's Latin for healing love. And what you bring forward, Father, is a wonderful dose of hospice in all its different forms and how blessed those kids are to have you there and in a very real way offering that in a way that they can understand. And quite frankly, all the rest of us too. I mean, we need, we need exactly what you're doing right now. No, thanks. Well, I, I need what you're doing right now. So good thing we're all on the same team. Closing, any final thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, pray for me. <laughs> pray right. for my monastery. We, we're, we're all, I, you know, I, I, I just, I keep thinking about this glorious battle that we're fighting. And, you know, you're going to lose men and you're going to, there are going to be setbacks. I, in fact, I'm reading a book on the Chosin Reservoir campaign, which is a bunch of Marines were trapped in the middle of the mountains in North Korea by three battalions of Chinese infantry. And I, I, I can't imagine a more depressing situation, but that was like the greatest moment for the Marines. And here we are now, and it, it can feel like we're surrounded by evil, but this is our great moment. And, and so keep fighting and pray for me and I'll pray for you and we'll all wind up in heaven and we'll celebrate together. I love it. I love it. I can't wait. That will be a, a very joy-filled, very wonderful celebration. I can see, I, I'm anticipating that. But Father Wadi, you're, you're, you're awesome. And, oh, well, and I just, I'm. Well, this is, let's do it again sometime. Well, let's do, let's do. I'm planning that. Thank you so very you. much. You're quite welcome. With Father Augustine Weta, we've gone inside the pages of Humility Rules, St. Benedict's 12-step guide to genuine self-esteem. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website boards publisher Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.